All right. So theorem 5.4.1. We have already seen the statement, but before we see the proof, let's just see it once more for one last time. It's a necessary and sufficient condition for a real number to be constructible. So the real number alpha is constructible if and only if we can find finitely many real numbers, these lambdas, such that these conditions are true. That is the square of the first lambda belongs to the field of rational numbers. And the square of the ith lambda belongs to this extension of the field of rational numbers obtained by adjoining the previous lambdas to it. Okay, and such that alpha itself belongs to the extension obtained by adjoining all the lambdas to the field of rational numbers. So this is a necessary and sufficient condition for alpha to be constructible. So let's now see the proof. Although, um, I mean, uh, in the previous video also, we discussed about the proof a little bit, and it's there in the text, but it's not given in a systematic manner. So let's see how we can systematize the proof. So we need to prove both the directions that these conditions are necessary as well as sufficient. So we start off by assuming that alpha is constructible. Let alpha be constructible. Then by the definition of a constructible number, uh, we have this thing next. Then there exist constructible points. P and Q such that the distance between them is the absolute value of alpha. And here we are just using the definition of a constructible real number, nothing else. The distance between them is the absolute value of alpha okay so that that means just yes, you have two constructible points p and q somewhere in the plane such that the distance between them is the absolute value of alpha we of course take absolute value because alpha itself may be negative in that case if we just simply say that the distance between p and q is alpha then it would be meaningless Okay, so now the thing that we have at this stage is this fact that P and Q are constructible. Now before we uh, can make use of uh, this, okay, we are going to write something for this fact that P and Q are constructible. Before we do that, let us do another thing. Let us choose a Cartesian coordinate system in the plane because after all we are working in the plane. So we can choose any Cartesian coordinate system with an x-axis and a y-axis, of course, according to our convenience. We choose a
Cartesian coordinate system in the plane such that the coordinates of capital P and capital Q are 0 comma 0 and 1 comma 0 respectively. Do you remember what this capital P and capital Q are? If you go back to the definition of constructible objects, there we started off with two points in the plane. Those two points we called, we named them capital P and capital Q. That are at a unit distance apart from each other. Okay, so that the distance between them is one. Now, no matter how these points are situated in the plane with respect to each other, we can of course choose one coordinate system such that the coordinates of P become, uh, that is P becomes the origin and Q becomes that point on the X axis such that its coordinates are 1 and uh, I mean 1 comma 0. You can easily understand why that is so. In fact, these are the two points from where we start our compass and straight edge operations, those three things that you can draw a line passing through these two points, then that line by definition is constructible. You can also, for example, take your compass and spread its arms in such a way that the distance between those two tips of the arms is one. That is, because P and Q, uh, when we are beginning things, P and Q by definition are constructible points. Okay, so if you take your compass like this, you spread the arms of the compass so that the tips touch P and Q, then you have uh, measured a distance one using the compass. Then you can take the compass anywhere in the plane and taking any point as center, you can draw a circle. That is another compass and straight edge operation. That circle by definition will be a constructible circle. Then if it turns out that that circle intersects this line, then those points of intersection will be further uh, constructible points and that's how the, uh, the collection of constructible objects will increase in size okay so that that's what these points p and q are they they are the initial points from where we start our things so now that we have chosen one coordinate system conveniently so that p and q have these coordinates we can now say what small p and small q being constructible means or what it will give us See, small p and small q are also some points in the plane, but their existence has arisen because of alpha. It is given or we are assuming that alpha is constructible, so there exist constructible points p and q such that the distance between them is the absolute value of alpha. That's how we have p and q, but because p and q are constructible, each one of them is constructible by a finite sequence of compass and straight edge operations starting from capital P and capital Q. Okay. But what is that going to give us? Let's see. So the next thing we write is uh, this. Uh, okay. But before we write the next sentence, let, let us just uh, observe one thing about capital P and capital Q. Note that 
P and Q lie in the plane of F, F0 means uh, the field of uh, rational numbers are y though. That is because by the definition of this, uh, the field of, uh, I mean, sorry, the plane of a field, the coordinates of both P and Q are rational numbers. So that's why they are points in the plane of this field. In other words, they are points in this Cartesian product. This is the plane of Okay. So now we come to the constructibility of P and Q. By re okay. By repeated, let me just erase that part first. It's crucial to understand the next line properly. The line is this. By repeated application of the result of exercise 5 and the discussion of uh, well uh, discussion on page let me give you the page number also 229 in the text we get real numbers okay so what we have written by repeated application of the result of exercise 5 we have already seen what exercise 5 says and the discussion on page 229 in the text we are going to get some real numbers with some properties we are going to get real numbers alpha 1 alpha 2 and uh, they go like that till say alpha s and another set of real numbers beta 1 beta 2 and so on up to beta t such that Okay, there are many things to write such that alpha 1 square is a rational number and alpha i square belongs to this extension of uh, the field of rational numbers which is obtained by adjoining the previous alphas for what type of i for i varying between varying from 1 all the way up to s uh, where well should i write that thing first or okay let me just write this itself where f not of alpha 1, alpha 2 and so on up to alpha i minus 1 is defined to be there are some uh, quite a few technical things to write here. <coughs> After completing this part we will uh, try to understand what all these things mean and uh, where they are coming from. This is defined to be equal to F naught for I equal to 1 
and just like that we need to say similar things for these betas beta 1 square is a rational number beta i square okay there here the suffix varies over a different set of numbers so let me call it j beta j square belongs to this extension of f naught j minus 1 for j varying from 1 through t where beta 1 beta j minus 1 is defined to be f naught for j equal to 1 such that p and q belong to the uh, well should i write belong to or lie because they are points p and q lie in the planes of this and this respectively well so many things huh? but let's try to understand what is going on here okay now what we have uh, written here actually just comes from the fact that small p and small q are constructible now what does that actually mean it means because p and q are geometric points for example, P being constructible means that we start from capital P and capital Q, then by a finite sequence of compass and straight edge operations, we get to small p. That means uh, compass and straight edge operations means you start with capital P and capital Q. Say you uh, draw that line that passes through capital P and capital Q. Say you also draw those circles of radius 1 in many places. So that gives you some new points, new constructible points, constructible by definition. And those points appear as intersect points of intersection of these geometric objects, lines, circles, and uh, such things. Okay. But then using those new points, you can then continue this process and take things even further to get even more new points. And this process continues. Right, so that there we are just simply using the compass and straight edge operations. And the new points that we are getting at each stage are constructible points by definition of constructible points. Fine. But where is exercise 5 coming into all of these things? Let's recall what exercise 5 says. Let me erase this first part. What exercise 5 says is this. Say you have a field F and suppose that there exists a positive real number gamma that is an element in f a field f means of course a subfield of the field of real numbers not just any field so a positive real number gamma belongs to f then exercise 5 says that if you consider any straight line 
in the plane of air and any circle in the plane of air then they intersect at some points which lie not necessarily in the plane of air but in the plane of this well i i should not have said it uh, like this uh, rather the proper way of saying it is this say you have a straight line in the plane of air and you have a circle in the plane of air and suppose they intersect at some points here you see two points it may be one point also if the straight line is a tangent to the circle okay then exercise 5 says that there exists a positive real number gamma which is an element of air such that these points of intersection become points in the plane of this extension of air okay that's what exercise 5 says but we know another previous result which says that if we have two straight lines in the plane of f and say they intersect then that point is a point again in the plane of f okay so that means in general if we have two straight lines or a straight line and a circle or two circles in the plane of f and they are intersecting then those points of intersection in general will lie in the plane of this for some gamma if you change your geometric object say you take a pair of uh, um, these objects say you take one straight line and one circle then for that there is a gamma for another set of these objects say another straight line and another circle also in the plane of this you will get another uh, such number gamma some gamma prime say so now can we rephrase this a little uh, differently let's see what if we are calling root gamma lambda we are just simply calling it by some other name that's all then this conditions uh, get turned into this no? now the points of intersection lie in the plane of f lambda and gamma which is lambda square belongs to f okay so what do we understand from this situation we understand that when we start applying that sequence of composite straight edge operations that we will have to go through in order to get small p from capital p and capital q then the process will look like this you have capital p and capital q say you draw a straight line through them and you also draw some circle or maybe you have two straight lines and note that these things that you uh, consider you know at at this stage i mean in the part very first step they lie in the plane of the field of rational numbers why because the line that you will draw through p and q that is that is the first step right um that passes through p and q so by the definition of a line in the plane of a field this line in particular lies in the plane of f not why because it passes through two points which lie in the plane of f also the circle that we have chosen here can of course be chosen somewhat uh, more carefully so that its center becomes a point 
or its center is taken as a point whose coordinates are rational numbers. And already the radius is 1, so that is a rational number. So by definition, that circle becomes a circle in the plane of F0. And you deal with such things so that in the first step or in the first stage of these things, you end up getting what? You, you end up getting more points. Those are constructible points. But they lie in the plane of what? Not necessarily F0 because lines and circles are intersecting each other. So you will get some real number lambda such that lambda belongs to F0 and these new points lie in the well, uh, I should not have written lambda belongs to F0, but lambda square belongs to F0. And these new points of intersection lie in the plane of this. And then you use in the next stage these new points of intersection and carry out this process so that in the next stage you will get another such real number say lambda prime but now you are working in the plane of this so lambda prime square belongs to this and the new points of intersection lie in the plane of this extension or this now we don't really know how many times this process has to be repeated but a finite number of times. Also you keep one thing in mind that at one step you are only looking at the points of intersection of some one line and one circle or say two lines. That's it. Not more than that. That's why at every such step you are getting one real number that behaves like this and the new points of intersection lie in the plane of this extension of f0 then in the next stage also you take some one circle or one line or two lines now in the plane of this new field so you get another real number whose square belongs to the original field original field but original new field and the new points of intersection lie in the plane of this extension of that extension. And this process goes on a finite number of times and eventually you get P itself as a point of intersection of some lines uh, or some lines or some line and circle. You get the point. Now by the time you get P, you would have obtained a finite number of real numbers, say alpha 1, alpha 2, up to alpha s. And they should behave like this. That alpha 1 square, the square of the first one belongs to f0, just like this one. And the square of the ith one belongs to this extension of f0, obtained by adjoining the previous alphas to f0. You, you can see the pattern. You, you can uh, continue this. Um, by seeing one more step, you get the pattern. So that's how, because P is constructible, so to get to P, we end up having these real numbers, which behave like this, for I varying from 1 through S. But of course, no one knows what, uh, I mean, uh, I is also al allowed to have the value 1 here. However, if you have i equal to 1 here, this does not add up, right? This symbol becomes somewhat problematic. So its meaning has to be defined. When i is 1, then by this we mean f0. So all the things now fall in place. And such that the final uh, extension, which we obtain by adjoining all the alphas, 
that extension contains uh, I mean I should not say that that extension contains P but P lies in the plane of that finite extension right because that that's what having the point P as a as an intersection of geometric objects in the plane of the previous extension means okay so that's why P lies in the this extension this final extension obtained by adjoining all the alphas to F and the same thing is for there for beta also I mean for Q for Q also we have obtained some such finitely many real numbers that behave like this see the square of the first one is a rational number and the square of the jth one belongs to this extension obtained by adjoining the previous betas to the field of rational numbers and here also if j is 1 then we define this symbol to mean just f not the field of rational numbers and such that q lies in the plane of this the extension of f not obtained by adjoining all the betas okay so all these conditions stem only from the fact that p and q are constructible points right now we are going to join these two things okay now We are going to define some other real numbers which are going to be the alphas and betas but in a systematic manner. Now defining gamma k to be equal to alpha k if k lies between 1 and s and equal to beta k minus s if k lies between s plus 1 and s plus t we get Okay, but before we write what we are getting, do you see that the first s number of gammas, that is gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3 like that up to gamma s are nothing other than the alphas. And the subsequent gammas are just the betas in the same order. Because if you put for example k equal to s plus 1, what do you get here? Beta 1. And if you put the last one k equal to s plus t then you get beta t and you uh, similarly you also have the intermediate ones so we are going to get similar things like this gamma one square is going to be a rational number and gamma i square will belong to this extension of the field of rational numbers up to gamma i minus 1 for but now the variation of i will be uh, the full variation as many values as I can take where similarly just like before uh, well a few okay Uh, instead of writing i we could have written k you know, because we are we have defined the gammas using that suffix 
square. Let me just use k. k minus 1 for k lying in, in this range. And where this symbol just simply means the field of rational numbers for k equal to 1. But that's not all. We have to say what these things are for such that both P and Q lie in the plane of this extension obtained by adjoining all the possible gammas to the field of rational numbers but is it true you, you just think let's just think of it okay gamma one of course is just simply alpha one previously also we had uh, that the square of alpha one belongs to f naught now also we have that thing but how is this true if you vary your k starting from one all the way up to s then those gammas are just alphas. So, you, you see, if your k lies in this range, say, then this condition looks like what? This condition just simply looks like alpha k square belonging to this right and we already had these uh, conditions for the alphas but what about the conditions that come after this right now if our k lies in this range then let's see what uh, we get if we write this this thing this containment of the square of those elements in terms of betas because now we are going to get betas so in place of gamma k what shall we write we will write beta k minus s square because that is gamma, gamma k square and uh, well, the things will start from gamma 1. So that means what? That means alpha 1, alpha 2 and like that up to uh, alpha s it would go. But after that, we will have beta 1, beta 2, etc. Uh, up to what shall we have this? Beta. Um, 1 less than this k minus s minus 1 okay this is how this condition would look if k lies in this range do you see what uh, happened to all these things the first s number of gammas by definition are just the alphas after that we start having the betas in their natural order beta 1 beta 2 like that we do not reach this one, but just before that we stop. Okay, so now can you see if we uh, use one variable in place of k minus s, I mean uh, say we give it some other name. Let us just simply call k minus s i. Then how does this look? Beta i square belongs to f naught alpha 1 
alpha 2 up to alpha s beta 1 beta 2 just like that and k minus s will be just i. So that means these conditions for this type of uh, range of k ultimately just boils down to this. But is this true? That is the question. Originally what do we have? Oh and one more thing, from these inequalities what do we get? k minus s which is nothing but i for us now is less than or equal to t. Originally what type of things uh, did we have for our betas? Originally we did not have this. Originally we had this. Beta, although we had j, but let's just forget about j. Let, let's call j itself i now. i minus 1, where this is what we had or it is not a single thing, these are uh, many conditions. Now, however, we have extra things. The alphas also uh, are there, they have also been adjunct to this extension and this extension of course is not that extension. But note that because the beta i square belongs to this and what is the relationship between this extension and that extension? Obviously, this one is bigger than that because we have adjoined even more things, okay, maybe from outside. So that means this extension is actually a subfield of this even larger extension. for the same variation of i. Now, because our original beta i squares belong to that extension, so automatically it will belong to the larger extension. That's why this part is in fact true. But that is just one thing. We are also at the same time saying that p and q lie in the plane of this. Is that also true? That also we need to check. So, for all these things, uh, this part is only for our understanding. Let us now see how P and Q belong to the plane of this. Okay. Originally P belong to what? P is in the plane of this. Right? And Q is in the plane of this, this extension. But both of these extensions are subfields of this. Why? Because our extension obtained by adjoining all the gammas is nothing but this. So, if P and Q are lying in the planes of this and this respectively, then automatically P and Q simultaneously lie in the plane of this. Since these are both subfields of this and so the planes that we are talking about, that is the Cartesian product of two copies of this, also the Cartesian product of two copies of this, both of these planes are subsets of the 
plane of this that is the partition product of two copies of this larger extension so that's why it is justified if we say that p and q lie in the plane of this but then what have we achieved here we have achieved uh, some real numbers gamma 1 gamma 2 all the way up to gamma s plus t which also satisfy similar conditions and such that the final extension uh, gives us a plane in which both p and q are lying okay but this is not the end of course there are other things you remember we are not primarily interested in p and q but we are interested in alpha it's because of alpha that we are having the points p and q so the next thing we write is this let the the coordinates of p and q uh, with respect to our partition coordinate system that has already been chosen in the beginning itself b u comma v and u prime comma v prime respectively then the absolute value of alpha is square root of gamma where gamma is the square of u minus u prime plus the square of v minus v prime that is just simply the distance formula that comes from your uh, coordinate geometry so it's just simply a another way of saying that this quantity this real number is the distance between p and q But now note that this belongs to the plane of this. This gamma belongs to the plane of this. Why? That's because we said that P and Q both belong to uh, I mean both are points in the plane of this but what does that mean that means that the coordinates of P and Q both are elements coming from this field extension and that's why when you take their uh, differences square them and add them up that is again in the field so that's why it belongs to the field and because of this thing we now have this note that well um, what did I want to write here square of a new okay okay mm -hmm. and alpha belongs to this you may be wondering why we are uh, doing this last part is this extension uh, not the thing that we are ultimately uh, trying to get? No. Because you see, 
the final extension that you will write must contain alpha. What you have obtained here is an extension that contains absolute value of uh, well it the extension itself does not contain absolute value of alpha but it contains the square of the absolute value which is gamma and gamma belongs to this so that means in your list of real numbers that you have already got which satisfy uh, those conditions you need to add one more thing and that is this absolute value of alpha you adjoin that also to this extension so that uh, now it's complete. Now alpha belongs to the final extension and see that the same pattern is followed even by this last element because its square belongs to the previous extension and when you adjoin it to the previous extension, you get a new extension which contains the thing that you are uh, that you started with, that is your constructible number. So we have ended up showing that, uh, let us just uh, summarize what we have got so far. Otherwise it may be difficult to see all the things at once. So what we have so far got is this. It was given or we started with the fact that alpha is a constructible real number. And we have obtained these real numbers. Gamma 1, gamma 2 and so on up to gamma s plus t and also this such that gamma 1 square belongs to f naught gamma 2 square belongs to f naught of gamma 1 gamma 3 square belongs to f naught of gamma 1 comma gamma 2 and it goes uh, it goes on like that eventually we have this gamma s plus t square belongs to s plus t minus 1 and then in the next step that is the next natural condition we have this because after this you have this number in the list S plus T, we are not writing the previous one, okay. And such that finally your real number alpha belongs to this final extension obtained by adjoining all the uh, elements in the, all the real numbers in the list. So is this not the condition that you are saying it should be there if alpha is constructible? Yes, it is. So this is what we have finally got in this part of the proof. So that means one half is over. We have shown that if alpha is constructible, then these conditions must be true, that we will get a set of real numbers that satisfies these conditions. That means these conditions are necessary for alpha to be constructible. But now we have to prove that it is sufficient also. Mm -hmm. So now we need to prove the converse part. Now I do not want to mess up the writing so let me just simply copy it from here and if there is some mistake we will uh, we will see okay we will hopefully recognize conversely let there be 
finitely many real numbers lambda 1 lambda 2 like that up to say lambda n such that the conditions are true that is lambda 1 square is a rational number and lambda i square belongs to the extension of f naught obtained by adjoining the previous lambdas for i varying from 1 through n where we are going to write all the things this is defined to be the field of rational numbers such that alpha uh, we already had uh, we have alpha but the thing now is that it is not given that alpha is constructible it is given that for alpha these things are happening and we have to prove that alpha is constructible okay so these are the things that are given this is our hypothesis now how we are going to proceed next is this this is where we use the result of exercise 6 so from the or rather the, how we have uh, obtained the solution that's what we are going to use from the solution to exercise 6 we are going to get uh, this the point whose coordinates are these lies in the plane of in the plane of this of course uh, but which we can write slightly differently like this ah uh, okay yeah i have okay there is a mistake immediately it's not it should not be written like this the point well the point definitely lies in the plane of this but that's not what exercise 6 is saying the point this in the plane of this does something yeah mistake means there is no mathematical mistake but a mistake in the way i have written it the point in the plane is that point yes is a point of intersection of a line say L and a circle C in the plane of
Yeah, when these things are uh, written down or typed out in LaTeX, then it seems like not a very big deal. But uh, while explaining, they take quite a long time. Um, yeah, in the plane of the previous extension. Okay, let us recall exercise 6. In exercise 6, what we uh, saw is this, right? When you have some positive real number gamma that belongs to a subfield F of the real field, then every point in the plane of this extension appears as a point of intersection of some line and some circle in the plane of F. Do you understand what I am saying? If you go back to exercise 6 and its solution, the solution that we have, it just says this that gamma is a real number which is a positive real number and it belongs to some subfield of uh, the field of real numbers. Then every point in the plane of this extension appears as the point of intersection of some line and some circle, both of which are objects in the plane of F. Now, do you see that this point is a point in the plane of this? Let, let us first see that. What, what is it that we I will erase that part? But you can uh, recall that we had this. No? In our final part of those conditions, we had this. So definitely alpha is an element in this field. So absolute value of alpha, which of course is going to be either plus alpha or minus alpha plus 1 will also be an element in this field and of course 0 being a rational number definitely belongs to this field. So both the coordinates of this point are elements in this field. That is why this point is a point in the plane of this field. But this field can itself be thought of as a field that looks like this, like this. where in place of F, you have this field. The uh, fact that we need, need these things, I mean we are needing it right here, that is why we chose F to be an arbitrary subfield of the field of real numbers while stating and solving all those previous exercises. Now in place of F, you have this and in place of gamma, you have lambda n squared. So then by the result of exercise 6, because this point now lies in the plane of this field, so it must be a point of intersection of some line L and some circle C in the plane of F. That means in our case in the plane of that. But there is a small problem. The problem is that lambda n should be positive in order to be able to write it like this. What if your original condition gives you some negative lambdas? What do you do then? That, that's not a very big problem. You see, say uh, in place of this lambda n, so let me just write some concrete numbers. Say you have things that look like this. Minus root 2 minus root 3 and root 5. Say you need to have, uh, I mean you have these lambdas there and you need to adjoin them to the field of rational numbers. Then instead of considering this extension, you can also just simply consider this extension, they are the same thing. So what I am saying here is that instead of the original lambdas, we can just simply uh, consider their absolute values. Because after all we are uh, 
adjoining something to a field if you adjoin something to a field or it's negative to a field you are going to get precisely the same extraction i leave it to you to understand why this is a very easy thing so i am not even going to mention it here that the lambdas that we have we have from those conditions are actually positive okay uh, non negative in general so that's why this lambda n can be written like this and this uh, there is no part uh, i mean there is no problem in this justification in this part so our point now appears as a point of intersection of l and c which themselves are geometric objects in the plane of the previous extension but now one can go back just like uh, in the first part we went forward now we are going backward in this way but uh, what does it mean for l to be a line in the plane of this that itself has a meaning no by definition it means that l passes through two points which themselves are points in the plane of that field so let's consider those points let l pass through the points so you understand that the existence of these points simply comes from the fact that l lies in the plane of that in the plane of that similarly what does it mean for the circle c to lie in the plane of this it means that the center of the circle is a point in the plane of that field that extension of f not and also its radius is an element in that field and let uh, okay well uh, let us write it in another line another line means uh, i mean after putting a semicolon and the center uh, what are we going to call this center something say p3 of c and its radius r are such that p3 lies in the plane of this extension and r belongs to this extension r is an element of this extension a positive element of course because it's a radius so that means in our process of reduction this is this is a reduction process right we have now obtained three new points from which actually we uh, have our uh, original extension i mean uh, the one that we started with p1 p2 and p3 they appear as points of intersection in that stage after which you have this okay i mean after which you have l and c 
but uh, we will of course have to consider one more point each of the points we already had p1 p2 p3 and now we are going to consider this point also is again by exercise 6 is a point of intersection of some line and some circle in the plane of even the previous extension that is this. So if we continue our reduction process like this eventually we will get to F0 naturally. So for that uh, what I have written continuing here. Yeah. Continuing this reduction, we see that This is a constructible point. Well, but why? And uh, you can, of course, if you want, you can write one more step in this uh, backwards gallery. We continue to have points from those lines and circles, but the circle that you have gives you one radius, and that radius for that radius, we then next consider this point, which turns out to be a constructible point. So, if you continue this process, eventually you are going to get to that point. Okay, not going to elaborate on this uh, anymore, but eventually you get to this point. And because in each stage, these points that we are getting are constructible, so that point will also be constructible. So, note that alpha originally was not constructible, in fact, that's what we are trying to prove. Alpha originally was a, just a real number for which those lambdas exist and those conditions are true. Now we have been able to reach this conclusion that this point is constructible. But this real number is the distance between this constructible point and this other constructible point whose coordinates are 1 comma 0. That means this is just your Q, that capital Q. So by definition uh, then alpha is a constructible real number. And this finally completes the proof.
yeah the proof is long and somewhat complicated not because of the fact that we have used some very complicated concepts or anything but because those conditions uh, amount to a lot many things are there and combining those things writing the things properly that takes a uh, a long time to understand understand in the sense a long time to uh, have all the pieces together and so that they fall in place to see that thing as a whole that takes time but even then if you feel that there are some uh, possible gaps that may be there in this proof then please let me know in the comment section below and also if you have not understood some particular part for example how is it that we are eventually going to get to that okay if you follow the uh, this uh, reduction process closely you will realize why we are going to get that eventually but after that we just simply have that alpha is a constructible real number from the definition because at this stage we are in a position to apply the definition directly so this proves that not only are those conditions necessary but they are also sufficient for alpha to be constructed now based on this theorem there are some consequences and using those consequences we are uh, eventually going to say i mean uh, we are going to extract a very useful condition for constructability so that we will see next week uh, well i am saying next week no no i mean in the next field theory video well i forgot this is not a sunday no and our next upload is this uh, friday and friday let's go back to vector spaces so with that i end this video tonight So see you on Friday. Until then, this is me, Lucifer from a Mathematical Pool. Have a nice night.